Section 10 of Astounding Stories, 12, December 1930, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sea Terror, by Captain S. P. Meek. Part 2. The Young Labor Party? I thought that gang was bankrupt and out of business since the Coast Guard broke up their alien smuggling scheme. They were down and out for a while, but they are in funds again. And how? They must have three or four millions, at least. Where did they get it? That's what we've been trying to find out. The leaders have presented bars of gold to a dozen banks throughout the country and demanded specie. The banks shipped the gold to the mint, and it was good gold. Nine hundred and twenty-five fine. What we are trying to find out is how that gold got into the United States. A shipment of that size should be easy to trace. It would seem so. But it hasn't been. We have accounted for every pound of every shipment that has come in through a port of entry, and we have checked almost that close on the output of every mine in the United States. If the gold came from Russia, it would have had to cross Europe, and we can't get any trace of it from abroad. It looks as though they were making it. Dr. Bird rubbed his head thoughtfully. Possible, but hardly probable, he said. How much did you say they had? Over three millions in thirty-pound bars. Each bar shows signs of having a mint mark chiseled off. But that don't help much, for they have done too good a job. It has us pretty well bluffed. Again Dr. Bird rubbed his head. Telephone Admiral Buck, and then phone Bolton, and tell him exactly what I told you to, that you will be away indefinitely. When he gets through exploding, tell him that you are going with me, and that possibly, just barely possibly, we might be on the trail of that gold shipment. "'On the trail of the gold,' gasped Carnes. "'Surely, doctor, you don't think—' "'Once in a while, old dear,' replied the doctor with a chuckle, which is more than anyone in the Secret Service does. "'You might tell Bolton that I said that. But hang up quickly if you do. I don't want the wires of my telephone melted off. No, Carnesy, I have no miraculous inspiration as to where that gold is coming from. I just have a plain old-fashioned hunch.' and that hunch is that we are going to have lots of fun and more than our share of danger before we see Washington again. After you get through bearding Bolton in his den, you might call the Chief of the Air Corps and ask him to have a bomber held at Langley Field, subject to my orders. If he squawks any, I'll talk to him. He turned to a telephone which stood on his desk and lifted the receiver. Get Mr. Lambertson on the wire, he said. He is the Chief Technician of the Pyrex Glass Works at Corning, New Jersey. The USS Miniconson steamed out of New York Harbor and headed down toward the lower bay. On her forward deck rested a huge globe. The bottom quarter of the sphere was made of some dark opaque substance, but the upper portion was transparent as crystal. Through the walls could be seen a quantity of apparatus resting on the opaque bottom portion. Two mechanics from the Bureau of Standards were making final adjustments of one of the pieces of apparatus which resembled a tank fitted with a piston geared to an electric motor. From the tank, tubes ran to four hollow pipes, an inch and a half in diameter, which ran through the skin and extended thirty inches from the outer skin of the twenty-foot sphere. Dr. Bird stood near, talking with the executive officer of the ship, and from time to time giving a brief word of direction to the mechanics. "'It's safer than you might think, Commander,' he said. "'In the first place, that globe is not made of ordinary glass.' It is made of vitrilene, a new semi-malleable glass which was developed at the Bureau and which is being made on an experimental scale for us by the Pyrex people. It is much stronger than ordinary glass, and is not sensitive to shock. It is also perfectly transparent to ultraviolet light, being superior even to rock crystal or fused quartz in that respect. The walls, as you have noticed, are four inches thick, and I have calculated that the ball will stand a uniform external pressure of thirty-five hundred atmospheres, the pressure which would be encountered at a depth of about twenty miles. I believe that it will stand a squeeze of six thousand tons without buckling, and it is impossible to fracture it by shock. It could be dropped from the top of the Woolworth building, and it would just bounce. It seems incredible that it could stand such a pressure as you have named. My figures are conservative ones. Lambertson calculated them even higher but we allowed for the fact that this is the first large mass of the material to be cast, and lowered them. "'But suppose your lifting cable should break,' objected the naval officer. "'The outfit weighs a good many tons.' 
You notice that the lower quarter is made of lead. The specific gravity of the entire globe when sealed up tight with two men in it is only a little more than unity. In the water its weight is so little that a three-inch manila hawser would raise it, let alone a steel cable. I have another safety device. Granted that the cable should snap, I can detach the lead from it, and it would shoot to the surface like a rocket. How long can you remain under water in it? A week if necessary. I have an oxygen tank and a carbon dioxide removing apparatus which will keep the air in good condition. The globe is electrically lighted and can be heated if necessary. Should my telephone line become fouled and broken, I have a radio set which will enable me to communicate with you. I can't see that it is especially dangerous, not nearly as much so as a submarine. What is your object in going down, if I may ask? To take pictures and to explore the wreck if we can. The globe is equipped with huge floodlights and excellent cameras. The salvage people are having a little trouble, and we are trying to help them out. You mentioned exploring. Can you leave the globe while it is under water? Yes, there is a locking device for doing so. A man in a diving suit can enter the lock and fill it with water. Once the external pressure is released, he can open the outer door and step out. Coming back, he seals the outer door, and the man inside blows out the lock and compressed air, and then the inner door can be opened. It's the same principle as a torpedo tube. A jangle of bells interrupted them, and the Miniconson slowed down. Commander Lawrence stepped to the rail and gave a sharp order to the navigating officer on the bridge. The bells jangled again, and the ship's engines stopped. "'We are almost over the buoy, doctor,' he said. Dr. Bird nodded and spoke to the two mechanics. With a few final touches to the apparatus, they emerged from the globe, and Dr. Bird entered. "'Come on, Carnes,' he called. "'No backing out at the last minute.' Carnes stepped forward with a sickly smile and joined the doctor in the huge sphere. "'All right, boys, close her up.' The mechanics swung the outer door into place with a crane. Both the edge of the door and the surface against which it fitted had been ground flat and were in addition faced with soft rubber. Bolts were fastened in the door which passed through holes in the main sphere, and Dr. Bird spun nuts onto them and tightened them with a heavy wrench. He and Carnes lifted the smaller inner door into place and bolted it tight. Dr. Bird stepped to the telephone. "'Lower away,' he directed. From a boom attached to the Miniconson's forward fighting top, a huge steel cable was swung down, and the latch at the end of the cable was closed over a vitrilene ring which was fastened to the top of the sphere. The cable tightened, and the globe with the two men in it was lifted over the side of the battleship and lowered gently into the water. Carnes involuntarily ducked and threw up his hand as the waters closed over them. Dr. Bird laughed. "'Look up, Carnes,' he said. Carnes gasped as he looked up and saw the surface of the water above him. Dr. Bird laughed again and turned to the telephone. "'Lower away,' he said. "'Everything is tight.' The globe descended into the depths of the sea. Darker and darker it grew until only a faint twilight glow filled the sphere. A dark bulk loomed before them. Dr. Bird snapped on one of his huge floodlights and pointed. "'The Arethusa,' he said. The ill-fated vessel lay on her side with a huge jagged hole torn in her fabric of midships. "'That's where her boilers burst,' explained the doctor. "'Luckily we have a hard bottom to deal with. Let's see if we can locate any of Mitchell's sea serpents.' He turned on other floodlights and swept the bottom of the sea with them. The huge beams bored out into the water for a quarter of a mile, but nothing unusual was to be seen. Dr. Bird turned his attention again to the wreck. "'Things look normal from this side,' he said after a prolonged scrutiny. "'I'll have the Miniconson steam around it while we look it over.' In response to his telephone orders, the ship above them swung around the wreck in a circle, and Carnes and the doctor viewed each side in turn but nothing of a suspicious nature made its appearance. The sphere stopped opposite the hole in the side, and Dr. Bird turned to Carnes. "'I'm going to put on a diving suit and explore that wreck,' he said. "'If there ever was any danger, it isn't apparent now, and I can't find out anything until I get inside.' "'Don't do it, doctor,' cried Carnes. "'Remember what happened to the other divers.' "'We don't know what happened to them, Carnes. No matter what it was, there is no danger apparent right now, and I've got to get into that ship before I can get any real information. 
We could have lowered an undersea camera and learned as much as we have so far. Let me go instead of you, doctor. I'm sorry to refuse you, old dear, but frankly, I wouldn't trust your judgment as to what you had seen if you went alone, and we can't both go. Why not? If we both went, who would work the air to let us back in? No, this is a one-man job, and I'm the one to do it. While I am gone, keep a sharp lookout, and if you see anything unusual, call me at once. How can I call you? On this small radio phone, a pair of receivers tuned to the right wavelength are in my diving helmet, and I will be able to hear you, although I can't reply. I won't be gone long. I have only a small air tank large enough to keep me going for thirty minutes. Now help me into my suit and keep a sharp watch. A timely warning may save my life if anything happens. With Karn's assistance, Dr. Bird donned a deep-sea diving outfit and screwed down the helmet. He crawled through the inner door into the lock and lifted the inner door into place. Carnes fastened the door with nuts, and the doctor opened a pair of valves in the outer door and filled the lock with water. He removed the outer door, and taking in one hand a steel-shod twelve-foot pike with a hook on the end, and in the other a waterproof flashlight, he sallied forth. As he left the shell he paused for a moment, and then returned and picked up the heavy wrench with which he had removed the nuts holding the outer door into place. He fastened the tool to the belt of his suit. Then, with a wave of his hand toward the detective, he approached the hulk. The hole in the side was too high for him to reach, but he hooked the end of his pike in one of the joints of the Arethusa's plates, and climbed slowly and painfully up the side of the vessel. As he disappeared into the hull, Carnes realized with a sudden start that he had been watching his friend and neglecting the duty imposed on him of keeping a sharp watch. He turned quickly to the floodlights and searched the sea bottom. Nothing appeared, and the minutes moved as slowly as hours should. Carnes felt that he had been submerged alone for weeks, and his nerves grew so tense that he felt he would scream in another instant. A sudden thought sobered him like a dash of cold water. If he screamed, Dr. Bird would take it for an alarm signal and possibly be afraid to emerge from the vessel. His watch showed him that the doctor had been gone for twenty-five minutes, and he moved slowly to the radio transmitter. "'Dr. Bird,' he said slowly and distinctly, "'you have been gone nearly thirty minutes. Nothing alarming has appeared, but I will feel better when I see you coming back.' He glued his eyes on the opening in the ship's side and waited. Five minutes passed, and then ten, with no signs of the doctor. Carnes moved again to the receiver. "'It has been over half an hour.' Doctor, he cried in a pleading voice, if you are all right, for God's sake, show yourself. I am frantic with worry. Another five minutes passed, and the sweat dripped in a steady stream from the detective's chin. Suddenly he gave a sob of relief and sank back against the side of the globe. A bulky figure showed at the edge of the hole, and Dr. Bird climbed slowly and heavily out of the hold and dropped to the sea bottom. He lay prone for a moment before he rose and made his way with evident effort toward the sphere. He entered the compartment, and with a heroic effort lifted the outer door into place, and feebly and with fumbling fingers placed nuts on the bolts. His hands wandered uncertainly toward the valves and closed the upper one. He waved his hand toward Carnes and sank in a heap on the floor of the lock. With trembling hands, Carnes connected the air and opened the valve. Air flowed into the lock, and the water was gradually forced out. When the lock was empty, he waited for Dr. Bird to close the outer valve, but the doctor did not move. Carnes tore at the bolts which held the inner door and threw his weight against it. It held against his assault, and he thought frantically. An inspiration came to him, and he disconnected the air valve. With a whistling rush, the air from the lock rushed into the sphere, and he forced open the inner door. A stream of sea water drove against his feet through the open valve and he reached for the valve to close it. The force of the water held it open for a moment, but he threw every ounce of his strength into the effort. The valve slowly closed. It was beyond his strength to haul the heavy doctor with his pressure diving suit through the restricted confines of the inner door, so Carnes wormed his way into the lock and with trembling fingers unscrewed the helmet of the doctor's diving suit. The helmet clanged to the floor and Carnes scooped up his hands full of water and dashed it into the doctor's face. There was no response, and he was at his wit's end. He sprang for the radio to order the sphere hauled up when his glance fell on the oxygen tank. It took him only a moment to connect a rubber hose to the tank, 
and in a few seconds a blast of the life-giving gas was blowing into the scientist's face. Dr. Bird gave a convulsive gasp or two and opened his eyes. "'Shut off the juice, Carnes,' he said faintly. "'Too much of that's bad.' Carnes shut off the oxygen, and Dr. Bird struggled to a sitting position and inhaled deep breaths. "'That was a narrow squeak, old dear,' he said faintly. "'Give me a hand, and I'll climb in.' With the detective's aid, he climbed into the sphere, and Carnes fastened the inner door. Slowly the doctor rid himself of the diving suit, and lay prone on the floor, his breath still coming in gasps. "'Thanks for your warning about the time, Carnes,' he said. "'I knew that my air supply was running short, but I was caught down there, and couldn't readily free myself. I thought for a while that my time had come. But it wasn't so written. By the looks of things, I freed myself just in time.' "'Did you find out anything?' asked the detective eagerly. "'I did,' replied Dr. Bird grimly. "'For one thing, the gold is no longer in the hold of the Arethusa. "'It's gone?' "'Clean as a whistle, every bar of it. A hole has been cut in the vault around the combination, and the bars slid back and the door opened. The gold has been stolen. Might it not have been stolen before the vessel sank? The idea occurred to me, of course, and I examined things pretty carefully. I know that the theft occurred after the vessel sank. How could you tell? For one thing, the hole was cut with an underwater cutting torch. For the second, look here. The doctor rolled up his trousers and showed the detective his leg. Carnes cried out as he saw huge purple welts on it. "'What caused that?' he cried. As I entered the vault, I stepped full into a steel bear trap which was set there for the purpose of catching and holding anyone who entered. Someone has visited the Arethusa since she sank, and looted her, and also arranged so that any diver who got as far as the vault would never return to the surface to tell of it. Luckily for myself, I carried a heavy wrench and was able to free myself. Most divers don't carry such a thing. But who could have done it? That's what we have got to find out, and we aren't going to do it down here. Give the word to have us hauled up. And, Carnes, don't mention anything about the looting of the vessel. Allow it to be understood that I couldn't get into the hold. We'll head back for New York at once. I want to have a few small changes made in this sphere before we use it again. While I am doing that, I want you to get hold of the Coast Guard or the Immigration Service or whoever it is that has the complete records in that case of alien smuggling by the Young Labor Party. When you get the information, report to me and we'll go over it. You might also drop a hint to Captain Starley that will stop all further attempts at salvage operations for a few days. Tell him that I'll arrange to have a Coast Guard cutter guard the locality of the wreck. Won't that be rather risky for the cutter? I think not. The gold is gone, and there is no reason to apprehend any further danger in that locality, at least for the present. At nine o'clock next morning, Carnes and Dr. Bird sat in the office of Lieutenant Commander Minden of the United States Coast Guard, listening intently to the history of the alien smuggling case. Commander Minden was saying, Their boats would load up and clear ostensibly for Rio de Janeiro or some other South American port but once they were in the Atlantic they would alter their course and head from the Massachusetts coast. Of course we had no right to interfere with them on the high seas, and they never came closer than fifty miles of our coastline. When they got that close they would cruise slowly back and forth for a few days, and then steam away south to the port they had cleared for. When they got there, of course, there were no passengers on board. We patrolled the coast carefully while they were around but we never got any indication of any landing of aliens, and yet we knew they were being landed in some way. We drew lines so close that a cork wouldn't get by without being seen, and we even had the air patrolled, but with no results. Eventually the air patrol was the thing that gave them away. They had been operating so successfully that they evidently got careless, and started a load off late in the night. So they didn't reach the coast by dawn. A Navy plane was flying along the coastline about twelve miles off when they spotted a submarine running parallel with the coast, headed north. It didn't look like an American craft, and they went on and radioed Washington and found that we had no undersea craft in that neighborhood. They returned to their patrol and followed the sub for a matter of thirty or forty miles up the coast, and then it turned in right toward the shore. The shoreline there is rocky, and at the point where the sub was heading, it falls sheer about two hundred fathoms. The sub ran right at the cliff and disappeared from view. Lieutenant Commander Minden 
paused impressively. Carnes and Dr. Bird set forward in their chairs, for it was evident that the crux of the story was at hand. When the plane reported what they had seen, we knew how those aliens were being landed. The point where the sub went in gave us a good idea of the location of their base, and we threw a cordon of men around and searched. A Navy sub was sent to the scene, and they reported that there was a tunnel opening into the rock about a hundred fathoms under water, running for they had no idea how far under the land. They stayed to guard the hole while we combed the land. It took us a week to locate the place, but we traced some truckloads of food and finally found it. This tunnel ran under the land for a mile and then ended in a large cave underground. The young labor party had established a regular receiving depot there, and took the aliens from the sub and kept them for a day or two until they had a chance to load them into trucks and run them into Boston or some other town in the night. End of Part 2